Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20-plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and entrepreneurship to help you harness your own inner tenacity and drive your career forward. My guest today is James Nielsen, CEO and founder of Vendition. Vendition is a sales development apprenticeship program, pretty cool, we'll get into that, that gives individuals the training and experience needed to earn entry-level jobs in tech sales. And prior to founding Vendition, James spent his career building, managing, and leading high-performing sales teams at venture-backed software companies, including, I'm going to try not to, is it? Ooh, yeah, la. Yes. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> you stream WiseLine and Int app. And, and James built and designed his first sales development team back in 2009. And it's considered one of the pioneers in the sales development profession. And he also created the first ever consumer sales boot camp in 2015 and still runs it. Consumer, sorry, salesbootcamp.com online program. And he got his start in engineering and sales after graduating with an MS and a PhD degrees in electrical e- engineering from a little known school called Stanford. And with that, let's get right to it. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Good stuff. So, you know, I want to bring my tribe up to speed who may not know you. Um, you originally were educated uh, as an engineer, but then clearly made the transition into sales. How did, how did, how did, how did that happen, right? Because we don't really hear too many stories like this. So I'd love if you could hit the rewind button and tell my guests who you are and what you do best. Yeah, for sure. No, definitely. There's not a whole lot of engineers that go into the sales profession. Um, a lot of in college students and recent college grads aren't really thinking about uh, sales and certainly not from an engineering perspective. But, you know, the uh, make the long story short, I kind of got recruited into it. Not kind of. I did get recruited into it. So, um, you know, first job out of college, working at Qualcomm, big company, and uh, one of the VPs of sales overheard me speaking in the kitchen one day and, you know, kind of started asking me some questions. And he had asked me if I ever thought about sales engineering. And I had never heard those two words in the same sentence, let alone know there was a profession. Um, and so, right. uh, and I didn't really have the greatest connotations about what sales was, to be perfectly honest. But as I got exposed into technical sales and business sales, I realized that, you know, tech sales, you're using technology to solve business problems. So anyways, I got recruited into sales engineering. And that's when I first became client facing, got to meet customers, travel around, had a lot of fun and, uh, and kind of eventually went all in on the sales side and haven't turned back since. Well, it's so interesting, too, because I, I, I'm in the recruiting business. And one of the reasons I think I'm a successful recruiter, because I recruit for marketing, media and advertising, because I worked in marketing, media and advertising. So I'm a subject matter expert in the area that I recruit for. Having that engineering background, combining that with sales, I mean, that's a double threat, man, right? Yeah, it definitely it definitely helped me in my career being so technical, especially since my whole career has been in software sales. And so, um, you know, when you're out there selling technical products, you understand the product really well helps you be a better seller because you know you have subject matter proficiency in your product. Also, you don't need uh, the same amount of sales engineering resources, if any. So it saves your business quite a bit of money because um, you don't need an SE traveling around the country with you. And uh, yeah, it was it's definitely been a very uh, big advantage in my career. So, so here's the deal, and correct me if I'm wrong here. I mean, if we're going to put a stereotype out there, you know, engineering folks don't always have the most inter- interpersonal skills. Did you have these interpersonal skills or was that something that you needed to, to, to learn? A little bit of both. I think uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I got recruited to be client facing is that that VP of sales that saw me in the kitchen, he, you know, he overheard a conversation and said, I think I can put this person in front of a client, which is uh, which is hard to find. Right. And like like yeah. you said, so that's kind of why sales engineers are paid so well, because uh, because they are difficult to find. You want that technical expertise. We also need to be able to feel comfortable putting it in front of clients. So you, you, you start to accelerate at, at being a sales guy, right? Hey, you're a sales guy. Hey, your friends and family, what you do? I'm in sales, right? I'm in sales. Like, wait a minute. Did James throw away his engineering degree? <laughs> Did he throw it all away? Did you get any kind of that? Like, no, no, guys, family, friends. 
I'm still doing what I went to school for, what I got my PhD in, just a little bit different angle. Yeah, I know. Definitely, definitely lots of friends and family thinking, what, 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 what's going on here? I don't understand. Shouldn't you be working for NASA or Boeing or something? I'm not sure what's going on. Um, you're working for these small startups, right? Because after Qualcomm, I went the startup route. And so working for these small startups doing sales and uh, yeah, definitely fielded lots of questions from family and fam- family and friends around how that even works and, uh, and if they're connected, if at all. Made some made for some good fodder at the Thanksgiving Day table. So, so you, you you were doing well in the sales group, and obviously you started to build teams and have folks underneath you. Um, how long did it take you to realize that you're really good at building these teams and instilling process? Is that the is that kind of the 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 combination of that introvert extrovert, you know, right brain left brain, uh, having the engineering piece to build, you know physical teams of people? Yeah, definitely. I I definitely had that kind of engineering mindset, um, that scientific method type approach when building and structuring not only a teams, how you hire, train, retain, but also the sales development process itself, right? Over the last couple of decades, sales and marketing just become such a science. And so you really, you know, every every minute spent, every dollar spent, where's it going? How does it attributed? Where does it show up in the bottom line? So it really is yeah, it's basically a big math equation. And so I think that certainly helped me in my career as I built out these early teams to really go about not only building successful sales teams, but also creating those measurable and trackable, trackable results so you continue to iterate and improve as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that perspective too. So talking about perspectives, I mean, you've worked at a, def- a, a number of different organizations, different sizes, different series uh, of funding, uh, depending where you're coming from. But the common thread in all these in all these places ins- is instilling culture. What's kind of, and even taking it today with your own company and brands, what's kind of your your, your approach to building, maintaining culture? And think back to some of those early jobs, the good, the bad, and ugly you've seen from a culture perspective. Yeah, for sure. And it's definitely kind of the pre-COVID versus post-COVID. So Vendition yeah. now is completely remote. So that's a, a whole new challenge that uh, that I haven't experienced before. But yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, you definitely want to create those, you know, culture is one of those mm-hmm. things, culture fit, culture ad that everyone talks about, but how do you create those those great cultures and, and what's the goal, right? If your goal is to right. optimize the day, then you know, or optimize the week, then you can, you can drive employees a certain way. But you know, if you do, if you drive individuals too much, they burn out, they move on, move, go to other companies. So it's kind of, you want to optimize short term and long term and really figure out how do you create those great cultures, make sure they enjoy work and they get what they want. And I think one of the misconceptions is that everyone wants the same thing, right? So if you hire a bunch of recent college grads, you know, people talk about, oh, Gen Z wants this or that. And it's really, you need to learn the individuals, right? Not everyone wants the exact same thing. You don't know. People say, oh no, it's more about work-life balance. Well, maybe it is for you or maybe it is for a lot of people, but some individuals just trying to pay the bills and really all they care about is make as much money as possible. And everyone says, oh, Gen Z doesn't care about money anymore. And it's not necessarily the case. So it's learning about the individual and creating that culture where they can thrive and optimize, have fun. They stay there, they hit their quota, perform. And so you have to take a, a, a higher holistic approach, but also look at the actual individual and make sure that each individual is getting what they need out of their day. They get the career path that they want, the growth opportunities, the learning, the exposure. So it really depends on the person. That's a, that's a fantastic point because we, we're in this day and age where it's just generalizations, right? It's just black and white, no gray in between. I mean, even talking about the work from home piece, like it's not either or, right? right? There's an and. There's an end. There's some folks that don't thrive in a home environment because of logistics and, you know, a plethora of different reasons there. And there's some folks, obviously, that are doing great working from home. But you have to listen. You hit the nail on the head there. And I think that's a key point about leadership, James. Everyone's different. Right. We all have different scenarios, different situations, the way we work. So it's not one size fits all. And I think that's really, you know, a, a key point here. Um, I saw you talking, you know, um, about how the majority of billionaires and CEOs originally started their career in sales. Why do you think that sales skills are so conducive to becoming, you know, a high level performer? Yeah, I mean, I think you really need to learn how to acquire and retain customers. I mean, that is the, you know, arguably the most important part of any business. Uh, I would say, you know, most people may say maybe the most important part are your own employees, which you just kind of talked about that creating oh, yeah. that good culture to keep them. Um, but maybe, you know, I mean, if you don't have customers, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And so no I think that individuals that learn how to acquire customers and retain them and the importance, and they've kind of been through the school of hard knocks, you've had a really high, uh, you know, high paying customer churn and how that happened. And so, um, and what customers want, how to build a sales team and a revenue channel. There's a lot of really smart say, you know, product and engineers out there that build these great technical products, but they can't quite acquire customers. They don't get funding. They don't get traction. And the product dies. Three years later, you see a competitor pop up and it's off to a wild success, right? And so we see that story all the yeah, time. And- so yeah, I think that's kind of, I think that's why these individuals that have put themselves in revenue generating positions early in their career understand 
how to prioritize and really how to retain um, and acquire customers. And, and and again, another tremendous perspective, but let's look at the flip side of the coin there with wins comes losses. Right. We all have losses, right? We, we have, we have, I have big fat L's in my loss column. I'm sure you do too. And I think that's what separates good salespeople from poor salespeople on how do they internalize and deal with it. I know, and I've told the story before too, I, I had a hard time with losses early in my career. There was one period early on in my recruiting where I had three offers turned down in recruiting in a, in a 72 hour period. And it almost put me down in the grave right? You know, right. In, in, in recruiting. So how do you, how do, how do you work with, let's just say you're, you're working with a, someone you see like a young salesperson and him or her, they have a great aptitude. They have a great energy, but they can't handle the losses, but you see something in their eyes. How do you coach somebody who doesn't do well with, with handling the losses and failure. Yeah. And I don't mean failure, a loss. Let's call it a loss, a sales loss, because that's not necessarily a failure as long as you learn something from it. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's it's a loss. Yeah, so they have to learn, you know, I mean, everyone's had everyone's had losses in their, in, in their lives, and some people handle it better than others. And if you have someone who has high potential to be a great sales professional, but you, you've you noticed that they're, they're not taking loss as well, you have to either get them used to it or have to help them figure out how to, get, you know, hmm. how to turn those losses, um, not when say into wins, but turn those losses into learning opportunities and also just kind of go through the reps because yeah, if you're going to be in the sales profession for a long time and you're going to be successful at it, you're going to lose arguably more times than you win. And so um, it's about losing quickly too, right? It's not just the learnings from it, but it, lose you want to lose fast. Move on. You don't want to lo- lose a, a you know a twelve month oh, sales cycle. Drag that's, that loss. that's brutal, right? You lose that in the first few weeks, ideally, but uh, but you know depending on the average sales cycle, you want to lose faster than you win. That's for sure. It's tough. An early lesson that I got in recruiting from one of my recruitment mentors, he said to me, he says, "You're going to lose, just like we're talking about now." He goes, "You could you could be upset with it until the minute you you leave this office." Do not bring that home. Do not bring that home to your family, your friends, your wife, your kids, what have you. Do not bring that home to them. And whatever you do, say you don't have wife, kids, whatever. When you close your eyes tonight, when you wake up tomorrow, it's over. Right. There's nothing you can do about it. The day is done. And it's hard to like kind of like, oh, yeah, you're blowing smoke on my ass. You know, you're kind of just, you know, fluffing me on that one. Um, let's talk about, I mean, mentorship, right? You you mentor a lot of a lot of folks underneath you. What are, what are some of those keys for someone who's looking for a mentor? Yeah. So I think it depends on kind of, you know, there's a couple parts of that question is, you know, how do you go find a mentor? And then also once you have a mentor, you know, how do you, how do you learn from them and, um, and make sure there's responsibility on both sides of the equation. Let's not forget that. Like if you're a mentee, there's a responsibility. hundred percent. So I think, yeah, that's a question we get asked and, you know, someone says, I want a mentor. I'm just going to go reach out to someone on LinkedIn. But you know, if you get a cold email from someone saying, Hey, I like your career. Could you want to be my mentor? It's like, who is this person? What's in it for me? Even if they want to give back, it's kind of, you know, there's some confusion there. So really it's about, you know, how do you grow your network? Right. And so are you showing up to events right now that some events are starting to happen again? If you're a sales professional, are you going to these conferences? Are you going to events? Are you, do you, can you get a mentor at your current office, someone in a leadership role that you aspire to be like, or follow their career? Because they're, that person's going to move on at some point, you're going to move on at some point. And so if you can keep that connection, that's a good thing. So the best mentorships kind of happen naturally. They're not necessarily someone that's just like cold outreach or being seeked to someone in your no. professional network. But obviously if you don't have a professional network, how do you get that? That's where, you know, kind of your company or a buyer or customer kind of sometimes can introduce you. And then once you have that connection has been made, then, you know, what are the expectations, right? Is this someone that you're going to have coffee with once a month, once a year, something in between? Um, what's the, is there an agenda, right? And so I think you kind of want expectations to Expectations sure. are a big one. Exactly. From both parties is kind of, and, yep, go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying that, I mean, that's just a general life skill, managing, managing, ex, managing and setting expectations. Exactly. And correct me if I'm wrong, in the mentor-mentee relationship, it doesn't always have to be a 50-50 value prop on both sides. Exactly. In most cases, it's not. There's no way that like, you know, if one of my mentors has got 30 years experience than me, but what you get out of it is, is the, 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 the act of giving back. And you learn a lot from being a mentor. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't have to be 50-50. It could be 90-10 or even 99-1. But even even that 1%, mm-hmm. right, they're still, you know, they're, they're getting to give back. They're, they're learning about how, you know, someone more junior position than them kind of thinks and behaves and wants. And it's going to help them um, in future hiring. So there's, uh, there's, there's lots to gain on both sides. That's for sure. The podcast is brought to you in partnership with Venturi, the recruitment operating system. The all-in-one tech platform purposely built for recruitment and staffing to unify your front, middle, and back office operations. Venturi is designed by recruiters for recruiters. Both the company and the platform are the unique creations of successful recruiters who sold their business, saw a need for a better recruitment tech, and made it happen. And if you're looking to upgrade your recruitment tech and give your recruiters a new modern operating system, visit venturi.io slash podcast 
That's V-I-N-C-E-R-E dot I-O backslash P-O-Z-C-A-S-T for an exclusive offer. Thanks. So let, let's get into it now. Why why is an earn and learn model like Vendition um, that offers a superior way? Why is it a superior way for that earn and learn, earn and learn, it's been a long day, model of the best way for someone to learn? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of educational challenges we face in this country and really worldwide, but we'll focus on the U.S. And, um, you know, I think the narrative that everyone should go to a four year degree and take out a two hundred thousand dollar loan is probably not the best yeah. solution for everyone. And so. Um, or people have already done that and now they're in their career, whether they're two years in the career or 20 years in the career, they want to make a change. You know, how do you earn a position that when you don't have the skills, when you don't have experience in the profession, right? This is something that not only recent college graduates face, but everyone. And so this is the explosion of kind of, you know, boot camps or, um, you know, do you go get a master's degree? Do you go take a certification, an online course? There's so many different options and models out there. And the vast, vast majority of them are consumer pay, obviously, right? Come in. Pay, give me twenty thousand dollars. I'll teach you how to be a product manager, and then good luck. Go, go apply for product management jobs, and um, we all know how that usually ends up. And so, in an earn and learn model, right, you are paid to acquire a skill set you don't have. And so, I think that's um, for the learner. I mean, I would argue, right? I would love to learn how to play the guitar. I don't have time, but if someone wanted to pay me money in order to teach me how to, Fine. that would be fantastic, right? So, if someone's going to pay me to acquire a skill set that I don't have and that I want. It's a pretty optimal way for the learner to acquire that skill set. And so within the sales profession, right, there aren't sales majors or minors or very few. And no, so they don't have those in college. Whether they're coming out of college or not, it's kind of like, you know, just like sales education has been a big gap in this country for more than a century. And so what does that totally look agree. like? And so companies have money and they have open headcount for entry level sales. They have a problem. Individuals who want to go into sales, right, they don't have money, but they want to work and they want to learn. And so there, you know, there needs to be this third party, which is Vendition to kind of, you know, bridge that gap and, and kind of run through the skills, which is, you know, we're all B2B paid. So businesses pay us to find and train the entry level um, sales reps. And then these individuals are paid to acquire the skill set through what we call an apprenticeship, but they are paid to acquire a skill set they don't have. And then it's off to the races. So yeah, I might be a little bit biased, but I think, I think it's an optimal way for our students um, because they are, yeah, they are paid to learn a skill set that they don't have and that they want. And then once they have it, then they're off to the races and, you know, making entry level jobs at $80,000 a year, right? It's, it's fantastic. fantastic for everyone. So let's just hit the rewind button and give us the, the, the TLDR, the quick down and dirty of the origin story of Vendition. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, you know, I've personally experienced both sides of the problem that we solve and I kind of alluded to it in the early days, but yeah, when I transition into sales engineering and, you know, I eventually became jealous of the sales rep, right? They're the ones getting the high five from the CEO and the big commission check and driving the fancy cars. And I said, Hey, I, I want to go do that. And they said, no, no, you should be a sales engineer. You're the science and, and math geek. Why don't you stick, uh, why don't you stick over minute. there? Um, and I said, well, yeah, you know, and I, I became frustrated because there were no real educational opportunities. It's like, how do I earn an entry level sales job? And I've never done it. The best advice I got was, you know, go buy a sales book. Um, and as we both know, you're not going to learn sales from reading a book. And so anyways, mm -hmm. I think back then it kind of planted the seed in my mind that, you know, why aren't there any educational opportunities within sales? And then fast forward through my career, as we talked about, moved into sales leadership roles, became a VP of sales at several different tech companies. And I found that the most junior positions on my team were the hardest ones to hire for, right? If I needed a senior field rep, I'd, I'd hire you, right? I'd go hire a recruiter. They'd go out there and find me what I want. I knew how to uh, assess them. I knew how to interview them. I knew how to train them. But for these entry-level positions, it's like, one, where do you even find them? Two, how do you assess someone for a skill set they don't have by definition? I can't interview someone so on how good they are at cold calling. They've never picked up a phone before. And then training them is just a huge resource constraint. So anyways, I kind of threw my hands up in the air and said, instead of complaining about it, I'm going to create the world's first sales school. And uh, we quickly iterated on this apprenticeship model. I love it. I love it. So, so just to, to level set here, this is for entry level jobs, right? Where people, it's a, it's a not a pay to play model per se, but everyone has skin in the game. The company has skin in the game. The candidate has skin in the game, and they're learning. They're they're learning a skill. Listen, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but why has this not existed yet? Yeah, no, um, you're absolutely correct. It's only entry level, and I think, um, yeah, you know, I think the. Uh, there's there's lots of different reasons why sales isn't touched by universities. It's just a hard profession to kind of learn in an academic setting. It's not meant to be taught on a whiteboard. Like I said, the advice I got was go buy a sales book. And so you really need that actual on the job experience. And so I think 
the world has a struggle to create a school or a, an educational model. And I think the apprenticeship model is, and again, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's perfect because it's actual on the job experience. When you think about the trades, right? You want to be a plumber, electrician, mechanic, you know, of course it's earn and learn on the job experience, right? It's you, an apprenticeship. Yeah. Those are old school, like you know, thousand year old professions. How do you think they did it? Yeah. You can't, you can't learn how to change the transmission on a car on a whiteboard, right? Or watching a YouTube video. You have to actually get underneath the car and get a wrench in your hand and, and start having some fun. Same thing with sales. You know, they don't, you can't, I can't lecture someone how to be an excellent cold caller. You have to pick up the phone and actually talk to some human beings again. So it's with, on, on the job experience with our curriculum, you know, one-on-one -on -one mentorship and coaching. And so it's kind of really, we package that all up in, in, uh, in a way that is, um, you know, very exciting for all three parties. I, I, I love it. Does it just apply to sales or are there other professions and verticals that you see this rolling out to? We only do sales, but clearly the sky's the limit. You know, we have big ambitious goals, just like a lot of small companies, but, uh, yeah. you know, we're just barely scratching the surface. So there's an incredible opportunity for us just within sales. And and what has been the biggest challenge as a as a founder of a startup um, business wise for you? What's been the, been the biggest challenge or hurdle or maybe an expectation uh, that that wasn't delivered upon? Yeah, well, I think you know in this kind of you know two sided marketplace that we have where we're uh, acquiring you know kind of interested individuals that are that want to go into sales, and then we're also acquiring customers on the B two B side, and kind of like how do you do that kind of matchmaking? Right, unlike Uber, we can't just do surge pricing. We can't just say oh. Lots of people need rides. We don't have as many drivers as we want. So we'll just increase the price. And then all of a sudden there's less people and everything works out, right? So we don't do that. We don't increase the, we don't increase the price for our customers if we don't have um, a whole lot of quality candidates in your, in your geo. So I think there's kind of that, um, that two-sided kind of matchmaking that has been a challenge, um, which also ties into kind of the, the geo restrictions, right? So if there's a company that's hiring in Denver and it's in person, obviously you can only introduce them to Denver candidates. So just figuring out, how do we set up these different cities as we grow and expand throughout the U.S.? Um, in you know, in the early days, that was difficult because it's just you know every hour we spend in Austin is an hour not in New York, and so there's kind of yeah. uh, some geo restrictions there. COVID made it really easy, as you can imagine, because when everything was remote, it was fantastic. We could put anywhere in the country to any business, and um, and now that some people are going back in the office, it's kind of it's that hybrid type environment. So we want to make sure that they're within striking distance of their office. I mean, how do you how do you go about? I want to get back to the hybrid thing in a minute. There, we'll put a pin in that one. But how do you go about recruiting the 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 talent, the folks that come into the program? Is it is it is it hand raising? How do you get the word out there that this exists? Because this is awesome, and it's also great for folks that are looking to transition. Right. I mean, I speak to so many folks in my career too, and there's a big trend now of educators, and it really sucks that you know a lot of folks are moving away. And that's a whole other podcast conversation about the move away from traditional uh, education jobs, but people are pivoting as well. How, what's what's your um, candidate attraction model? Yeah, so we we have a huge top of funnel, and I won't give away all of our secrets, but yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, as you can imagine, just some of them. it's roughly half of our recent college grads. That's easy because we know where they are; they're on college campuses, and then the other yeah, half you know is where maybe. They, you know, yeah, more career switchers. You nailed it. Uh, teachers, veterans re-entering the workforce um, after service. That was my next point. I was going to yeah. have it written down right here. I want to talk about how this is a prime, amazing, amazing service for veterans. And we'll link it up for all the veterans. And I'll tag everyone of my veteran hiring recruiters out there. For sure. Um, mothers and fathers re-entering the workforce after childcare, right? Whether it's a one-year break or a 10-year break or 30-year break. Um, and so there's just lots of different individuals and groups that are looking to make a switch and want more flexible environment, higher pay. Um, and so, you know, you have to cast a wide net and there's some very specific projects that we do for those different groups. And there's also just, you know, kind of marketing 101, paid acquisition, all of our social handles. Yeah, so, all, the, all, the, all the go to exactly, acquisition. We do all that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's all about kind of really filling big top of funnel. And then a big point of pride for ourselves is, is not only filling that top of funnel for us, but really being able to assess and be experts on assessing the trait soft skills and potential to be a great sales rep because obviously they don't have hard experience. Their LinkedIn and resume are essentially blank when it comes to the profession. You, it's aptitude. It's aptitude and attitude. So exactly. let, let's get back to let's get talking uh, about you know how everyone the beginning of the pandemic went remote and now going back and forth a little bit. Some of them going back into the office. But how, how did that affect your model and your and your business? And the second part of this, I, I have this hypothesis that the younger folks, the younger generation that are coming into the workforce remote are at a complete disadvantage. Yes, they may be more remote savvy, but they're not seeing what we did, the the, the body language, you know, all that kind of like mentorship that 
aren't words. Yeah. How to operate in a business environment, your composure, your posture, the way you the way you see senior leaders interact with each other. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, as far as affecting our business, yeah, it, it actually was, it made life a little bit easier for a period of time when everyone was remote because again, that kind of two-sided matchmaking that we do, it you know was a lot easier, them. right? So you could place, I mean, maybe the time zone a little bit, but someone up in Seattle can work for a company in San Diego, um, right. And so it, it actually made things a little bit easier for us as far as the matchmaking. Uh, we've been training individuals remotely as far as, you know, usually with the way the apprenticeship works is you physically go in office and then you do your vendition training remotely. But now everything was remote. So they were depending, our customers were depending on us to figure out how do you actually train and onboard entry level people in a remote environment. So that's a little bit about how our business um, has been affected. And obviously now that companies are starting to go back in hybrid environments or full time, they still need to be somewhat within geo. Although it's a longer, you know, you can commute further if you're only going in one day a week versus five days a week. Um, as far as the, yeah. as far as the second part of your question around kind of how is that impact? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm nervous to be honest. I can't imagine, you know, early in my career, just sitting at home in a, you know, an apartment with my roommates trying to, progress in my career. I mean, there's so much of those hallway conversations, the lunches, the coffee talks, finding that mentorship. I mean, just overhearing, you know, on the sales floor, overhearing how your peers handle exactly. different objections had- and kind of like, oh, hey, you know, what did you say over there? Like, look, can we talk about that real quick? Like I caught or, that, yeah. Like, I didn't even know we did that. Like, can you, you know, because I, as a former engineer too, one of the things that my, you know, my peers used to tease me about on, on the sales floors that I'd always go talk to the engineers, right? It was like, oh, James is like the weirdo who goes and, uh, you know, plays <laughs> ultimate Frisbee on Friday night with all the engineering team. And because I like to get to know them, what they were building and working on, what was coming down the product roadmap. It helps you in the sales process. For sure, yeah, for sure. Course. That's inside baseball right there. That's that's going to that's gonna differ. And you miss that being remote and some would argue it. And again, it goes back to what we said in the beginning. It's not black and white. It's it's and an or. Exactly, yeah. So I don't, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a problem. Um, there's no doubt that if you are 100% remote in your whole career, especially early, you are going to learn slower. Um, you're going to have less exposure to senior leadership. And, um, you know, does that mean you can't have a successful career? Of course not. But things are just going to take a lot, lot longer than, uh, than it did for you and I and others. Time will tell. I mean, this is the the very early days of this experiment. Yeah. And you know what? Some companies are going back to the office because you know what? That's where people have proven have been successful. And companies are going to figure out, are they losing top talent? And they're going to assess, they're, they need to evaluate. They need to give choice, options, and trust. Yeah. And that's really what it's going to come down to here. So, you know, you're, you're building out your organization. And I always like to ask um, leaders, what's kind of like your go-to interview question? If you're hiring, you know, uh, a senior leadership or or even solid mid-level someone on your team, what's kind of one of those go-to questions that you have, James, to really suss out? Listen, by the time someone gets to you, you've already looked at their background. You looked at their profile. You know where they work. You have a good sense of their skill set. Maybe you've given them a, an assessment at some point. But how do you how do you assess character in a, in a 35, 40 minute conversation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a number of different things we do both internally as far as bringing on our leaders, but also maybe I'll answer that from an entry level position because you're really trying to understand the individual and a lot of, for entry level sales, right? A lot of times we talk about kind of data points of excellence and how do you identify someone who's just, you know, kind of that winning mentality, right? They have that grit and worth that work ethic you're looking forward to. But actually, one of the things I like to do is I like to actually figure out the opposite. I want to know a time when you failed and how you responded. And, you know, you can ask the generic, like, tell me about a time you failed and how it's more about kind of like, learn from it? how do you dig into that, right? Talk about right. high school, whether it's their sports or band or whatever they were into and try to figure out things that they were disappointed in or didn't go their way. And then how did they respond, right? They went and they didn't make first chair in the trumpet and then they went and quit. And then there was, and it was that, that was the end of their music career, right? Or do they, or do they go and practice twice as hard and they gave up their weekends. And so you, you're kind of looking for that, that ability to, you know, kind of accept failure or defeat and then respond to it because that for us and for any sales profession, it's so crucial, right? If you're going to deal with, you know, we talked about, you're going to deal with a lot of rejection. So how do you handle rejection? And then how do you respond? How do you work harder? Um, to, you know, to kind of improve that skill set that maybe caused that rejection in the first place. So that's something that we kind of have some techniques to really dive into. And it's interesting for us, and you understand this from the recruiting world, but, you know, people are more honest with us than they are with with the company they're hiring with, right? So it's kind of like, we can identify that, pull that out. And if there's some gems in there, we can coach them on, make sure you bring that up, right? That's not, don't be embarrassed about that. Like you, you, you know, you had this challenge and this is what happened and that helped define who you were don't shy away from that, yeah, right? Absolutely. Bring that up. 
That's a great. That's a great take there. So let, let's bring it home, James. Let's bring it to the to the finish line here. But before we get to that, there's a piece I left out of the bio here, and I wanted to save it. Not many people know that you you have a true hidden talent, <laughs> and we have a true physical specimen in our president. We left it out, and this is the first time that I've had a Guinness Book of World Records holder on my show. He's former. He he lost that title and we'll get to that in a second. But fastest time in the beer mile. And before we got on, I watched the YouTube clip. If you could tell everybody a little bit about that. Is it a sport or an activity? Yeah. Tell us about that yeah. activity, that competition. We'll go ahead and call what it a sport. What is the beer mile? <laughs> yeah, the it's beer more of an mile. activity, right? It's a beer mile. So uh, uh, my my hidden talent, I guess. I didn't think these two talents of mine would ever be combined. Fascinating but- to drink. But there you go. So, um, yeah, the beer mile is, as you can imagine, you run four beers and run a lap, uh, run a mile, which is four laps around the track. You alternate. So you pound a beer, then run a lap, pound a beer, run a lap, do that four times. And, uh, yeah, I was the first person to break. Not only did I break the world record, but I was the first person to break five minutes. And so I ran 457 several years ago. And, um, you know, it's something. It does a fortune. Yeah, there's a website that tracks beer miles. It's been going on for decades. There's many thousands of entries. It's kind of a hidden sport within the you know college running community and the professional running community. But when I broke five for the first time, it just went absolutely viral. I got my 15 minutes of fame. It was you know ESPN sent a four That's camera amazing. crew to my house. I was interviewed live on TMZ. Good Morning America. So good. Front page of the Wall Street Journal. It was just like total viral phenomenon. Uh, that was uh, it's, it's yeah, a- it was pretty wild. But I mean, what was the impetus behind it? I, I mean, I did my research. You're, you're an avid runner. You were, um, correct me if I'm wrong, CEO of California Runners. What was that? You know, was it like as a road runners club? I mean, you're a runner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anybody watches yeah. this video, this dude's a gazelle out there. You could watch it. You could watch him run. And then the best part of the video, if you watch the YouTube video, and I'll link it up here too, the 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 training that went into it, understanding the anatomy, the upper esophagus, understanding the right temperature for the carbonation, for the optimal speed at which you could chug that beer and the practicing. I mean, this is a good stuff, people. This is what the podcast <laughs> is all about. Understand it. But here's a question going back to your question. H- how did it feel when you were dethroned? Yeah, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm not surprised that I was, be- I mean, obviously records are meant to be broken. Um, it did last for about a year and a half or so. And then once, a long run. yeah, a long run. Pun once intended. it was broken though, I mean, now I don't even know what the record. It's like 430 or something like that. I mean, it is officially in the hands of world-class runners. I don't even know if I'm on the top 10 list anymore. Oh, I'm like, yeah, I think I'm probably. I mean, you got Usain Bolt out there now chugging. Yeah, and- yeah. I'm like 11th or 12th on the list. So um, there's a good dozen people in the world that have broken broken five minutes now. And, um, uh, you know, I guess that was my Roger Bannister moment. I was the first one under five. But I, yeah, the, re- the world record is long gone and I am not getting it back. There's you, no way I'm running 429. Do you, have, do, you have, do you have the plaque though? Do you have the plaque from the Guinness Book of yeah, World yeah, Records? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, that's, that's awesome, <laughs> right? Like I would have that, I would have that right next to my logo. I would have it on my shelf up over there. So, so, so let's bring it home here. Uh, James, what is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on every day? Single great, uh, hard work pays off. I'm going to keep it nice and simple. I think there's this whole attitude of like, by that, work man. smart, not hard. And I mean, you got to do both, right? I, there's not a whole lot of, I don't want to say lazy, but there's not a whole lot of people that achieve high levels of success without hard work. And I, I, I don't love the narrative of just like, oh, just, you know, be efficient with your time. And again, depending on what your goals are, right? Um, but yeah, if you want to be uh, an extremely successful individual, you know, you have to work hard. Um, you can do that in an efficient way, but, in. but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I really truly believe that hard work pays off. It's so simple, but it, 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 it's so true. I have not had one person on this show who's successful that hasn't gotten there by putting in the hard work and paying their dues. And I think we're in this weird place in society where I don't even know where it's coming from. And I think maybe because the young folks out there are seeing these TikTokers and YouTube influencers just killing it. And it looks like they're not doing work, but actually some of them are doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Yeah. It's kind of a, an interesting conundrum there. So last but not least, you know, you look back on your life and your career and it, and it hasn't always been sunshine and rainbows and winning beer competitions and and developing an incredible um, disruptor into the recruiting uh, marketplace. But you think back on those times, James, when you when you when you had to pull yourself up, right? And you've had to harness that inner tenacity to drive you forward and that place inside that you had to go. And on the flip side, you sit here, gratitude, success, happiness, and you want to show that. What do you look towards? What do you pull you up? James Nielsen, what is your North Star in life? Yeah, I mean, I'm really passionate about the problem we solve. I think, um, you know, I think uh, when people, you know, your your career and and financial independence is just so dependent on, you know, skills and experience that you have. And I think if you don't have 
that pathway laid out from you because of the family you were born into or whatever. You just, you need an opportunity to put your foot in the door and not everyone was meant to rack up a bunch of student loans. And so I'm really passionate about what we're doing here at Vendition. I think apprenticeships are the future of education in this country. And, you know, we're doing that just for sales and maybe someone else will do that for some, to steal our model for some other profession before we get to it. Hopefully not. But, um, but I, I really think that there needs to be an opportunity to get paid to acquire a skill set, And I think that really gives, energizes me on a daily basis. And I'm super passionate about what we're, what we're doing over here at Vendition. And I think uh, there's just a massive opportunity in front of us. Harvard was the first university in the U.S. and they still have quite a good reputation last time I checked. So if we can be the first kind of corporate apprenticeship program in the U.S., I'm excited about what the next not only a couple of years, but really what the next several decades look like for, for this business. I think there's a good big opportunity in front of us. I love it, James. This is fantastic. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I want everyone to check out vendition.com, V-E-N-D-I-T-I-O-N.com. Um, and correct me, uh, the new playbook's out, the SDR playbook to onboarding, and we'll link that up. Yes, yes, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, you know, we're giving away our secrets. This is how you train and onboard entry-level sales development representatives. So, And I will link that up into the show notes. And James, where can folks find you? Where can they connect with you? Where can they learn more? Yeah, find me on LinkedIn. Probably the best uh, best place. I don't, I don't have too exciting of uh, you know Twitter or anything like that, but definitely go find me on LinkedIn. I'm there and I'm, and I'm active on, and on the platform. Good stuff, James. Thank you so much for joining us. And everyone listening at home, I hope you got a ton of value out of my conversation here. You know where to find out more at thepodcast.com. Follow us on all the social media channels. Remember, look out for one another, take care of each other, and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Bye, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.